Welcome to Reader Me Writer, Southern Edition, featuring T.J. Clune with his two books, The House in the Cerulean Sea and The Extraordinaries. We hope to provide some retail therapy, entertainment, and distraction during this hour. I'm Wanda with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. And now to today's event, T.J. Clune is a Lambda Literary Award-winning author, Into This River I Drown, and an ex-claims examiner for an insurance company. His novels include the Green Creek series, The House on the Cerulean Sea, and The Extraordinaries coming out in July. Being queer himself, himself, TJ believes it's important, now more than ever, to have accurate, positive, queer representation in stories. Hello, TJ. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, we're so happy to have you. Wonderful. Hi, everybody watching. I'm, I'm going to not see any of you because it'll make me distracted. And every, as if people, if you know me, you know, I tend to get distracted very, very easily. But um, I get to be here today because of two books. Um, I'm going to talk about both of them a little bit today and give you some background on me so you have an idea of why I believe what I do and why I think that own voices, meaning in my case, being queer and writing queer stories is, is super important. Um, the first book that I want to talk about and that I'll get to in a minute is The House in the Cerulean Sea, which came out uh, March 17th. So it's been almost three months since it came out and I just got news um, the other day that we're actually going into our second printing for the hardcover for that. So I'm very excited to see that that's going on. Um, for me, though, personally, I tend to be an intensely private person, though I do share bits and pieces of myself online and through my books. I tend to remain a bit guarded just for my own peace of mind. Um, that being said, to understand why I've taken the journey I have with my books to arrive here now at this moment, I wanted to give you some background on me so you know why I write the things I do. I was born and raised in rural Oregon, which tends to be the setting for many of my books, but I grew up in a poor area outside of Roseburg, Oregon called Melrose. I lived out in the middle of nowhere, basically in farmland, um, which if you are, as I was, the loud, over-talkative, slightly effeminate kid, it doesn't do well in, in such places. I used books as an escape. Um, my saving grace growing up was the Douglas County Public Library. I spent uh, most of my summers there, um, my library card being the absolute greatest thing that I owned, and I spent hundreds of hours reading whatever I could get my hands on. It didn't matter the topic or if it was fiction or nonfiction or even if it was far above my reading level, I, I didn't care. I wanted to read everything and everything. Um, I, I read Wilson Rawls and Dean Kuntz and Robert McCammon, Stephen King, Patricia Nell Warren, Bill Watterson through Calvin and Hobbes, and many, many others that allowed me to leave the world behind at least for a little bit. And it was through my love of reading that I found my love of writing. When I was a kid, say, six, seven, eight years old. I had this notebook that I carried with me wherever I went, filling it with stories about my adventures with a character from a video game. Um, there was a video game that I loved desperately called Metroid. And in that game, you are a space marine fighting aliens. And so I would fill this notebook with my chicken scratch about all these stories that I would have with the main character. Um, I began to move away from writing about existing stories to writing original work. One of my best memories, and it's something that has stuck with me to this day as I've gone on my writing journey, is from seventh grade. I had two teachers in seventh grade. They were Mrs. Bentz and Mrs. Pfeiffer. They gave us this assignment where we had to take a memory we had and turn it into fiction uh, and to tell a comedic story. I can't exactly remember what I wrote about, but what I do remember is as watching Mrs. Bentz reading uh, our stories while we all sat doing other work. And I was very, I was getting very sweaty because I could see my very identifiable new kids on the block folder getting closer and closer to the top. And when Mrs. Benz finally started reading mine, I was panicking. 
Uh, I try not to show it. <laughs> Imagine being uh, an 11, 12 year old trying to be subtle and it just doesn't work. Um, I watched her out of the corner of my eye. She started chuckling, then laughing louder and louder. And then she pulled over Mrs. Pfeiffer to read. By the end, they were laughing so hard they were crying. They told me that they loved this story. And it was then that I realized that the pow there was power in the written word, that it could bring joy and happiness to others. In my last class with them, they told me they couldn't wait to the day they saw a book with my name on it on the store shelves. And to date, I have actually published over 20 novels from contemporary to science fiction to fantasy. I worked my butt off and in 2016, I was able to quit my job of 10 years at an insurance company to write full time. Um, it was one of the scariest decisions I've ever made, but it was important to me, not just because I, <laughs> not just because I wouldn't be chained to a cubicle working at an insurance company whose lizard commercials you probably all know and despise, um, but because of the stories I'd have more time to tell. The through line for all of my books is that they're about queer people from all walks of life. That's important to me. Own voices, authors, especially now more than ever, are a necessity. We need queer people telling queer stories, but not just for queer people. They're for everyone who wants to read them. Fast forward to 2017, and I wanted to try something just a little bit different. So I wanted to see what else was out there in the publishing world. I had been with an indie publisher um, since 2011, and I felt like I was getting a bit stifled, like I wasn't having the, the room to grow that I wanted. And, and the, the thing that I wanted the most was to not become the best writer in the world, but become the best writer I could be. And I think there's a very big difference with that. So I wrote two books, one at the end of 2017 and one at the beginning of 2018, um, both of which are why I get to be here today. I contacted an agent who'd read one of my books previously uh, and re had reached out wanting to represent me. I wasn't ready for an agent at the time, so in my infinite wisdom, I said no. <laughs> and I, I, uh, she, she said, no, that's totally fine. Go do what you need to do. And so with these new books, I kind of had to go crawling back on my hands and knees saying, hey, do you remember me? I wanted to talk to you about some new stuff. And I gave her the books to see if we could be a good match. She read both of them and through, through uh, her hard work on my behalf, she signed me as a client and turned around and two months later, I had two three book deals with Tor and Tor Team. I have a, a contract with them for three uh, fantasy books for, that are geared, I guess, towards adults. And then I also have a three book YA series, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, this this obviously was huge for me, just for me as an individual, but also I, I couldn't help but think that this is just going to mean so much for me as a for a wider audience for a wider audience, because my publisher and what I love about Tor and Tortin and Macmillan as a whole is that they understand the value of queer voices and is affording me an opportunity that I couldn't have envisioned in my wildest dreams. The reason the first book that I want to talk about is The House in the Cerulean Sea. This is a, well, it, it's been described, and I think my favorite thing that I've heard about it is that it feels like a literary hug, um, which is something that I think that we all need now more than ever. Um, Cerulean is a whimsical standalone novel following the character of Linus Baker, a by-the-book caseworker for the department in charge of magical youth. He is set on a top secret assignment to an orphanage on Marcius Island where he's charged with determining whether six dangerous magical, magical children are likely to bring about the end of the world. He is sent to investigate them all, but Arthur Parnassus, the charming and mysterious master of the orphanage, will do anything to keep the children safe, even if it means the world will burn. The House in the Cerulean Sea is a story about queer love, found family, and seeing people for who they really are instead of what the world wants them to be. Uh, while Linus, a fussy man in his 40s who lives by the rules, is the narrator, the children he comes into contact with are the true stars of the book, as I've, as many, many people have told me after they've read it. The children are 
Talia, who is a girl garden gnome with a long flowing beard and a propensity to threaten anyone she thinks will hurt her family by preemptively digging their graves in her garden. A forest sprite named Fee, who distrusts anyone she doesn't know and can grow trees out of nothing. A wyvern, which is a small dragon, called Theodore, who hoards buttons underneath the couch. My favorite character, though, is an amorphous green blob named Chauncey, who wants to be a bellhop more than anything in the world and is made out of pure sunshine. Sal is the oldest of the bunch and the quietest. He also happens to be a shifter. I have another series of books I've written that's, that's proven to be uh, popular with my readers about werewolves. I didn't want to go that direction with that. So here, uh, Sal is a were Pomeranian. And six-year-old Lucy, who I expect is, and as I've come to believe and shown, is the favorite of many. He's wicked sharp, heartbreakingly funny, and loves what he calls dead people music, like Richie Valens, The Big Bopper, and Buddy Holly. Lucy's magical abilities are a little bit more extreme in that he is the Antichrist. I had been toying around with the idea of magic something for a long time. I'd already delved in the world of wizards in another series, um, but I knew in this case, children would be involved that the discrimination against who they were and what they could do would be at the forefront, but I wasn't quite sure how to make the pieces fit. Uh, I had these visions of a uh, Studio Ghibli Aesthetic, which is an animation house out of uh, Japan, uh, by way of Tim Burton, with more than a little pinch of Edward Gorey thrown in the mix. I have this print hanging above my writing desk of the Gashley Crumb Tinies. Um, and the more I looked at it, the clearer the picture became in uh, my head. I decided to start by researching orphanages in the 19th and the 20th century, which, as per usual for me, led to my favorite website in the entire world, Wikipedia. Now, I love Wikipedia more than I can say, and I can spend hours on it clicking through articles until I'm nowhere near the topic I started out reading about. Through my research, I ended up on the subject of something called the 60s scoop. Beginning in the late 1950s through con continuing through the 80s, the Canadian government took indigenous children from their homes and put them into government sanctioned facilities. The goal was to foster or adopt the children out to primarily white middle-class families in Canada, the US, and Europe. It's estimated that by the time the practice ended, over 20,000 children had been taken from their homes. Lawsuits were filed in the 2000s, but it wasn't actually until 2017 that the victims of the 60 Scoop were awarded compensation to the tune of, of over $800 million. I think, and this is when I, sat down to write this presentation months ago, the world was not in the place it is now. Especially today, what we're seeing in America and across the world. I think we're often in bubbles of our own making and we tend to focus on the now, what's around us that has an immediate effect on our lives. It is, in my opinion, at least, a flimsy excuse for not knowing about the wider world. The more I researched, the more stories I found in the history of our own country and abroad about children taken from their homes because they were different. The basis of this was stark, assimilation, to make those we didn't understand like us because anything other than familiarity is terrifying. And so I sat down to write, careful with how I did so. It was important to me that I get this right because the onus was and is on me. I began to tell the story of magic of children who came from magical families in an Orwellian society where the government sees all and knows all. These children were something to be feared because they were different and therefore needed to be corralled together and put into government run orphanages overseen by employees called masters who answered to the caseworkers of the department in charge of magical youth. The story I started out to tell isn't quite the story that ended up with in the final version of the house in the Cerulean Sea. It changed on me and for the better while the book does deal with some heavier themes, it is a gentle comedic fantasy reminiscent of older works in the genre that we really don't see much anymore. I was, back then when I wrote it, desperate to see some good in the world and put kindness out through the written word. A little did I know that two years later when the book actually finally came out, we would need that more than now more than ever. Um, I... If, if you had told me back in 2018 when I finished writing this book that we'd be in a worse off place than we were back then, I would not have believed it. 
um, the world is on fire and everyone seems to hate everyone else. The news is dire almost every day and more and more we hear stories of people of color, queer people, people whose faith helped to guide them all suffering because we're not what others think we should be. We're not assimilated. See something, say something. It's a mantra repeated throughout the House in the Cerulean Sea, a mandate set forth by the government. The lead character, Linus, is a cog in a bureaucratic machine, listening to those in charge while keeping his head down and doing his job to the best of his ability. He cares for all the children he comes into contact with, but by the time the novel opens, he's stuck under the weight of the society in which he lives, a dreary place where the rain never ends. It's not until he arrives at the orphanage on Marcius Island, which is meant to be an homage to Dorothy stepping out of Kansas into Oz um, and gets to know the people there that he sees just how much he's gone through life with blinders on, doing what he was told because it was expected of him. He lives in a bubble. Change, Linus is told, starts with someone speaking for those who can't speak for themselves. During his investigation of the mysterious orphanage and its inhabitants, he begins to see how wrong he's been and what his actions have uh, unwittingly wrought. He also finds himself growing closer to Arthur, the master of the orphanage, something that he never saw happening for himself. Though the children are at the forefront of Linus's realization that the world isn't how it should be, it's also through his burgeoning relationship with Arthur that, he, that Linus begins to understand that he must step outside his carefully constructed life in order to find the truth. It's my hope that people who read Cerulean will reach the final page and stop and think about how they act towards others who are different and others who aren't like them. When, the, when I actually, right before the book came out, I told myself that if, if somebody got to the final page and was able to close it and they were able to breathe a happy sigh, then I've done my job. And what makes it so interesting, at least on my end, is that I was hoping that parents would read this book with their kids. It's age appropriate. It can be read, I would say, a 9, 10, 11 year old would be able to pick it up and read it the same as an adult, though it might work on different levels. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite responses that I've gotten so far is when I'm hearing from parents who have read this book with their kids. And um, that to me is is something that I wish that I could have had when I was a kid. I didn't have the type of home situation where parents would read books with their kids. So to be able to hear that I've been able to do something like that and to have parents read my book with their kids and be able to discuss after it, it has been one of the, the best honors of my writing career. I have been just so absolutely thrilled at the reception that this book has gotten. And again, The House in the Cerulean Sea, it's out now. It is, it is uh, available at bookstores, and I'm hoping that <laughs> when this pandemic kind of hopefully goes away, I'll be able to go out and enjoy seeing my book in a bookstore, because I haven't been able to really do that yet, as I live in Virginia, and my, my town has been on lockdown for the past three months. So um, while I wish the world was in a much different place, I think that this book came out at exactly the right time um, because I think that we could all use some hope and some kindness and some laughs. I mean, when you're writing a book about a six-year-old antichrist, you, you can't really take yourself too seriously all the time. Um, the second book that I get to talk about today is a little different. It's called The Extraordinaries, and it comes out July 14th, and it's actually my young adult debut. It is the first book in a trilogy and is a queer coming of age story about a boy with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, named Nick Bell and the superheroes he loves who protect his city. He loves superheroes so much that he writes fan fiction about them. And he writes so much fan fiction that he's actually the most popular writer in the Extraordinaries fandom. And while he does have his stories that he writes and that he puts so much effort into, he doesn't think of himself as a, an extraordinary person. He sometimes has a hard time focusing and can be pretty obsessive about the things he loves. So much so that after he meets one of his heroes and his biggest crush, an extraordinary called Shadowstar, Nix makes it his mission to do something he's never done before. That's never been done before, in fact, to turn into an extraordinary, even though he doesn't have superpowers. And he's bringing his best friends along for the ride. Uh, two queer girls in a relationship named Jazz and Gibby and his best friend, Seth Gray, the one person who understands him the most and who also might be the love of his life if only he wasn't so completely oblivious. 
as I said previously, I've written The House in the Cerulean Sea was my 25th novel. The Extraordinaries will be my 26th. But this book, The Extraordinaries, is important to me. I'm like Nick. I'm neurodiverse, which is a fancy way of saying I have ADHD. For a long time, I hated that part of myself. It was an otherness, something that made me different than most everyone else. And then when I realized I was queer when I was a kid, I remember the first thought I had was seriously, I'm gay and disordered. But I love, I learned to love being neurodiverse because it is in its own way, my own personal superpower. Neurodiverse people like me can often have their brains move at a million miles per hour with a bunch of jumbled thoughts that take time to sort out if they do at all. Nick says it best when he explains in the book that his brain is like the world's fastest car, but it has the squeaking wheezy brakes of a bicycle. It's gotten better as I've gotten old, older because I've learned through medical professionals how to manage it, but it's something that's always going to be with me. A kid with ADHD will be a teenager with ADHD who will turn into an adult with ADHD. Um, and this is something that I desperately wanted to get across with Nick. He struggles with his ADHD, wishing that he could be more than he was. He wants to be extraordinary in all sense of the word. I wanted to give a voice like me, or a voice to people like me, to those who were told they talked too much, that they needed to calm down, even when their brain wouldn't allow them to. When you're a kid, who goes undiagnosed with ADHD, you don't obviously have the tools to be able to function. And I was disruptive in class. I was, I had to move. I always kept moving. I had to keep busy because if I tried to stop, my body would just start to vibrate on its own. And it wasn't until I got older and was actually able to get the tools that I needed in order to, um, manage my ADHD that I was able to find out what kind of a person that I could be. Um, but when I was trying to figure myself out, I couldn't find people like me in fiction, a queer kid with ADHD. If queer people were in books, they were over the top flamboyant sidekicks who acted like offensive parodies, or they were attacked and hurt because of their sexuality, or they got sick and died. And though books have gotten much better in that regard, especially in the young adult space, we still have a long way to go. And that doesn't even begin to cover neurodiversity rep. While I have seen some representation for neurodiverse people, it's often written from the perspective of somebody who does not have ADD, ADHD, anything like that. And you can tell when somebody either A, does not have the same thing you do, or B, has not done the research. And it's painful because we still to this day deal with the stigma. And I mean, think about it. If, if I tell you if this person has ADHD, you'll have a certain thought that goes through your mind right away, whether it be an unconscious bias or just that's how you think, that's how it is. Um, but I'm hoping that through being not only an own voice as queer author, but an own voice as neurodiverse author, that I can help try to change the stigma behind being neurodiverse. Um, the, but the, the bigger part of this, especially coming with, with the, the, the superhero aspect of it, I love uh, comic books. I love comic book movies. I've seen every Marvel movie multiple times and the same with all the DC movies. I wanted to write a book about queer kids living in a world where superheroes lived alongside us, even if they kept their hid identities hidden away. When I was a kid, I would read X-Men, X-Force, Batman and Spider-Man, Superman and Wonder Woman, wishing I could be like them, that I could have powers like shooting lasers out of my eyes or the ability to zap people who were mean to me with lightning, <laughs> like the X-Men Storm. Um, and while I never quite learned how to make that happen, I decided to use my superhero brain to instead tell stories like The Extraordinaries, where superheroes saved those who needed help and stood up for, to those who were wrong. Um, the Extraordinaries is not a coming out story. While the coming out trope has a very valid place in fiction, I didn't want to write that. I wanted to write about queer kids who were already out and who were all accepted by the parental figures who didn't give a crap about who their kids loved. It's important for me 
and I'm especially to say this now, there is no homophobia in the extraordinaries. The reason being is because we live in 2020. And while the world currently right now is showing us how far we still have to go, the idea that I need to put, or that any author needs to put homophobia as a trope in their book just to have their characters go through some kind of uh, obstacle, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, we need, I think that we need to do better than that. And I wanted to write about these queer kids who didn't have to worry about telling people that they were queer, that they lived in a place and a time that they could be who they wanted to be and figure themselves out as they go along. Yes, it may sound a bit trite and yes, it's fiction, but I really wish it didn't have to be. I wish that, that there are 15, 16 year olds out there who are figuring out who they are and they don't have to worry about telling people who they are because for fear of the reaction. They can worry about having to tell people because it's a big thing and it can be kind of scary, but I want them to be able to do so with the knowledge that they'll be safe and that they, that nobody will, nobody will essentially be mean or bully or belittle them for who they are. And while that being said, for all the heavy topics, this book is a comedy because I like to laugh. I like to be happy. Nick, as a lead character, does some pretty stupid things in order to try and be a superhero. For instance, there's a scene when he decides to try and emulate Peter Parker, AKA Spider-Man, to try and get bitten by a radioactive spider. But he doesn't have a lab to visit like Peter did and he's a little afraid of spiders as most people should be. So he decides to enlist the help of his friends. The problem with that is that his friends are also afraid of spiders, so instead they bring him a cricket. And since he doesn't have a lab with machines that could zap it full of radiation, he decides in his infinite wisdom that he's going to nuke it in the microwave for five seconds since there is radiation to heat the food in a microwave. I won't spoil what happens, but let, let's just say that the cricket doesn't actually go anywhere near the microwave and Nick doesn't turn, get turned into Cricket Man, especially since his superpowers would most likely end up him being, having to rub his legs together and make weird noises like crickets do. <laughs> and this is just the beginning of the adventures of Nick and Seth and Jazz and Gibby. As I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a series. There will be two more books after this one, all about Nick's journey into becoming the hero he knows he can be. I love writing about superheroes and I hope that one day I'll get to write a comic book but until then, this is going to do just fine because I get to spend time in a world where people can fly and villains are evil, but also where we know that the heroes will always win so long as they stick together. And who knows, maybe one day my version of superheroes will be right up there on Marvel and DC on the big screen and people like me can see that we belong alongside Iron Man and Thor and Batman and Superman. Thank you for listening to me ramble <laughs> for the past 20, 25 minutes straight. Um, I really appreciate it. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Should you all have any? TJ, that was not a ramble. That was <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it is time for questions. It's important. Everyone stays muted so we can all hear. So in the chat option, again, at the bottom of your screen, begin all questions with a capital Q and name your local store. Linda Marie is gonna go through all the questions and find them, and she will be asking the questions, asking your questions of TJ. Linda Marie, do we have a question for TJ Clue? Yes, um, how does being neurodiverse affect your approach to writing? What's your writing life like? I, as I, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, I get to do this full time and What's very important, I, I won't speak for, for neurodiversity as a whole, as a blanket, because it, it's very different for a lot of people. But for me personally, I have to have a schedule that I am set by religiously. Monday through Friday, I, and this will probably explain to you why I, I was able to write 25 books <laughs> in, in almost 10 years. But uh, I get up every morning at 6 a.m. I prepare for my day and at 6.30, 7 o'clock, I am in front of my laptop and I write for the next five, six hours. If, I, if some days are good writing days, some days are bad writing days. If you're an author if you've, or if you've ever tried to write, you'll know that there are days when you can write 
a billion words. And then there are days when even the idea of writing one makes you want to pull your hair out while you toss your laptop out the window. But for someone like me with ADHD, having the set schedule helps. And it is something that uh, I had to work on when I first quit my job, because when you, when you actually do quit your job and then that next Monday happens and you see that, oh crap, I don't have to go to work today. <laughs> I'm technically unemployed. Um, a panic can start to set in. So I, I knew that if I was gonna do this, I would have to do it right. So from the very beginning, it took me some time to work out some of the kinks, but it's all about the schedule that I keep five days a week. <laughs> and so far I've been able to do pretty good, obviously, if I'm here, so. <laughs> Um, there are a number of questions, but several people have asked if you could read a, a part from your book, one of your books. Yeah, definitely. I can totally do that. Um, let's do, uh, let's see the house in the cerulean sea. Um, this, this scene is when Linus, towards the beginning of the book, he first arrives at the island. He doesn't know quite what to expect. Um, and he is, he is coming to this house that's set on a cliff. And he's, he's by himself along with his cat Calliope and he doesn't know what to do from here. So he's, he's got out of his car to follow his cat and we'll go from there. He followed the trunk of the tree down to the ground where he saw a little statue, a garden gnome. How quaint, he murmured as he moved toward the tree. The statue was bigger than the ones he'd seen before, the tip of its pointed cap about waist high. It had a white beard and its hands were clasped at its front. The paint job that had been done on the statue was remarkably detailed, almost lifelike. The eyes were bright blue and his cheeks rosy. Strange statue, aren't you? He said, hunkering down in front of it. Had Linus been in his right mind, he would have noticed the eyes. However, he was tired and out of sorts and worried about his cat. Therefore, the noise that came out of him wasn't that surprising when the gnome statue blinked and said rather haughtily, you can't just say that about someone like that. It's rude, don't you know anything? His strangled scream, was loud as he fell backward, hand digging into the grass beneath him. The gnome sniffed, you're awfully loud. I don't like it when people are loud in my garden. If you're loud, you can't hear all the flowers talking. And she, because she was a she, beard and all, reached up and straightened her cap. Gardens are quiet spaces. Linus struggled to find his voice. You're, you, she frowned. Of course I'm me, who else would I be? He shook his head, managing to clear the cobwebs before landing on a name. You're a gnome. She blinked owlishly at him. Yes, I am. I'm Talia. Are you Mr. Baker? If you are, we've been expecting you. If not, you're trespassing and you should leave before I bury you here in my garden. No one would ever know because the roots will eat your entrails and bones. She frowned again. I think. I've never buried anyone before. It would be a learning experience for the both of us. <laughs> Thank you. Really good. Um, we have a one viewer from... South Africa. Oh, wow. Hello. Yes. Says, I have an emotional attachment to certain characters in your books, like Tiggy, Gary, and Otter. I keep, <laughs> I keep rereading them because I miss them. Have there been any characters you struggle to let go? Yes. Um, in the house in this really, there, there, there have been three books that I've written in my career where I have formed such a strong emotional attachment. I love, I love, obviously I love my books. I love what I do and I love what I write, but there are three books that I've written in my career where I've finished the book and didn't want to change a thing. Obviously that's a lot of hubris on my part because editing changes a lot of things and necessarily so. Uh, the first book um, that I felt that way uh, came out in 2015, which is How to Be a Normal Person. Um, and that book dealt with uh, autism and dealt with asexuality. And the lead character of that is a man named Gus, who is my, one of my favorite characters I've written. Second book is The House in the Cerulean Sea because it made me happy. I, I was happy writing that book. And I think that if the author is happy when they're writing the book, I think that shows through the writing. The third book that uh, made me as, as excited is something that will come out in 2022, which is also from Tor, and it is a big, grand adventure that I can't wait for people to read. Cool. Uh, another viewer asks, because you mentioned Gus, 
Will we see more Gus in the future How to Be series? No, I've, f- I've finished with that series. I, I wrote the first <laughs> book, and as my readers will know, I said, I'm never writing a sequel to that. Stop it. And then I turned around a few years later and wrote a sequel to that. So now I'm saying, no, I'm not writing another sequel, but who knows what I could do in like three or four years' time. But in all seriousness, I loved where I left those characters, and I... I want to be able to move on to um, different stories that I can't wait to tell. Do you, depur- do you prefer to write for middle grade, young adult or adults? I think every single one has its advantages. Um, but I, if I had to, if I had a preference, it would probably be adult because I, I've been very careful here, but I tend to have a, sailor's mouth. I, I tend to curse left and right. And when you're writing YA and, and for even younger, you really don't get to do that so much. <laughs> so I, I just for my own preference and own peace of mind, I, I tend to prefer writing adult fiction. But um, with this YA, my YA debut coming out next month, it's opened a whole new world for me. And I'm, I'm so excited to see what uh, people think. Um, a fan of Ernest and Hadley books asks, what made you want to get into writing YA books? Um, it, it basically boiled down to not having people like me. Um, as I said previously, there were, there were the YA is at the forefront of diversity. That is, that is, I think everybody, booksellers, librarians, authors, everybody can agree to that. YA is, is the forefront of diversity. Um, and I, 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 I hope that adult fiction will follow that. But the reason that I wanted to write a YA book, aside from wanting to write about, from wanting to write about superheroes is wanting to put a queer neurodiverse character at the forefront of a story because we don't get to have that. We don't, queer kids with ADHD, we really don't get to have that kind of positive representation because there are people out there who are teenagers that, who are struggling. Maybe they don't know they have ADHD. Maybe they were like me and went undiagnosed for far too long. And I, I want to give them an opportunity and a chance to say, to find this book and say, this is like me. This is who, this is a character that I can see myself in. A lot of you, many of you watching probably know of the queer initiative for young people called It Gets Better that came out a few years ago. And It Gets Better campaign, if you don't know, was basically saying, hey kids, it sucks for you right now, but it'll get better down the road. And it really, I, while I understood the, the the message that that was being conveyed, I can't help but think, why can't it be better now? Why why do we have to say, hey kids, don't worry about how you're feeling now. In a few years, you'll be out in the real world and everything will be fine. We're much nicer out here. That just, that bothers me. And I want to be able to have these conversations and be able to give these kinds of stories to kids who need them now, not later. And Marie, we have time for one more question. Was there a character in Cerulean Sea who grew into much more than you planned? Yes, Fee. Fee is the the haughty forest sprite who um, who in the initial draft of the House in the Cerulean Sea didn't get to have the limelight as the other five kids do. Each, each of the kids has their very own distinct arc and they have their own very distinct personality. But for some reason, I let Fee fall by the wayside. And when the book went into edits, the, the, my editor, my lovely, lovely editor, Ali, um, said, hey, we need to pay some attention to Fee. We need to, we need to bring her about and put more. So I actually wrote an entire new scene that wasn't in the initial draft of, drafts of the book centered around her and the main character Linus where she after they go on a kind of adventure Linus follows her and her mentor out into the forest and he watches as she grows trees 
And this particular type of tree that she grows is, is actually a real tree in the real world. Um, they're clones of each other, essentially. And it's, they think it's one of the oldest organisms on this earth. So essentially, when you see all these trees that are very distinct, they have white bark with bright golden leaves. And you see them, they all grow in groups. But what you don't necessarily know is that they are clones of each other. And that even if you were to chop them all down, there is a massive root system underneath that grows and will replace the clones. And they will be exactly the same tree that they were before. And that message that came across in that, it's not exactly subtle, but the message that came across like that is we have to dig underneath to find our root systems. We have to just pass the surface level and we have to, to see what's underneath instead of what's, on, uh, what's right in front of our eyes. And that to me was a moment where Fee came into her own because she was the one teaching Linus that lesson. And that's a lesson that he needed to learn. And without it, without my editor saying we needed to put that in and giving me the idea for it, I don't know that the book would have been half as good as it is. And I think that Linus and Fee um, grew as characters and with each other. And I was able to give her her very own distinct voice at that point. Thank you, TJ. That was wonderful. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you everyone for being here. Yes, if you enjoyed it, let your bookstore know by ordering TJ's books. Please do. And, and I want to say one thing real quick too. Yes. Thank you to all the indie booksellers and librarians who have, who have hand sold my books or, or recommended my books because without you, there would be no me, there would be no us. And so I totally 100% appreciate everyone that, that does what they do because you talk me up and that makes me happy. <laughs> so thank you. It makes me so happy too, but it helps so much TJ when you write great books. That helps oh, thank so you. much. <laughs> yes. uh, be in touch with your bookstore with any suggestions for how this could be better. And you can pre-order The Extraordinaries from them. Um, go ahead and buy it now and then you'll get your book when it comes out. Thank you again, TJ, for being with us. Thank you, Linda Marie and Nikki, for your help. And this is Wanda signing off.